Hello and a very warm welcome to you all on this Ash Wednesday from St. Michael's Chapel in St. Nicholas Church in Broadway. As we gather in prayer and reflection at the beginning of the season of Lent, we will hear the Bishop of Salisbury's Lent sermon broadcast from Salisbury Cathedral. And so let us quieten our hearts as we prepare to spend time in the presence of our loving and merciful Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Brothers and sisters in Christ, since early days, Christians have observed with great devotion the time of our Lord's passion and resurrection, and prepared for this by a season of penitence and fasting. By carefully keeping these days, Christians take to heart the call to repentance and the assurance of forgiveness proclaimed in the Gospel, and so grow in faith and devotion to our Lord. I invite you therefore, in the name of the Church, to the observance of a holy Lent, by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. So let us pray for grace to keep Lent faithfully. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may receive from you, the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Gospel reading for Ash Wednesday is from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, the sixth chapter. Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your, let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, 
there your heart will be also. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, May I speak and may you hear in the name of God, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. The scriptures on Ash Wednesday are always pretty challenging. But this year particularly, beware of practising your piety before others in order to be seen by them. Well, I'm jolly glad you can. Um, But it's perhaps more challenging for those of us being seen than for those at home watching in private. Strange how the context helps us to hear the scriptures so vividly and differently. When I was first a vicar on the Isle of Dogs in East London, the loop in the River Thames at the beginning of the East Enders subtitle, Advent and Lent being penitential seasons, we used the Ten Commandments to prepare for the confession and absolution. The first time we did this, as the congregation left the church, the Cray brothers' driver, who had served ten years for a murder he claimed he hadn't committed, said quite quietly to me, I haven't heard those commandments read in church since I was a child vicar. I've broken nine of them and I'm not going to tell you what the tenth is. When I got to St Martin in the Fields, I introduced the same practice because it had worked so well. But there, one of the congregation asked why I thought the Ten Commandments were penitential. She said they're a joyful way of life, not penitential she was right. But given they're no longer part of the regular liturgy of the Church of England, it's good to have seasons when they're used as a reminder so that they aren't just a distant memory of childhood. I think I feel much the same about Lent as a whole. Ash Wednesday is solemn, but it's also joyful. At the start of Lent, we're reminded of our mortality and of the ingredients of the joyful simplicity of the Christian life by self-examination and repentance, prayer, fasting and self-denial, and reading and meditating on God's holy word. It's not an exhaustive list, but its purpose is to disrupt and change the rhythm, pattern and focus of our lives in such a way as to bring us back to God and make us people who are bigger and more fully alive. And the Gospel reminded us that charity is part of that because it teaches us to love and live for others. We might feel this year that the impact of the pandemic means that there's not much more we can give up this Lent. It's a blessed relief to be able to gather for worship, even with most of us online. How this works sacramentally is a bit of a mystery, but if God can be present in bread and wine, he's just as present here online. And we have enough experience of worship to know that even at home, we gather in company with others online. In various settings, I've been asking what we're learning through this pandemic. In what ways is the virus a stimulus to Christian faith? Some things became clear very quickly and they remain true. I'm impressed by the adaptability of churches throughout the diocese. While some remain open for collective worship with smaller numbers, most, I think, have moved online. The quality of what offered is offered is remarkable. 
It has been a way for us to worship together as best we can. It's almost miraculous. And it's been a reminder that one of the reasons Christianity is a great missionary religion is because of the incarnation. Christianity takes root in every time and every place, including online, during a pandemic. Our schools and teachers have been magnificent and so have families homeschooling. We know, we all know it takes a village to raise a child. So the pressure on families is a growing problem. Online is good, but it's not sufficient. We've also witnessed churches serving their local communities through good neighbour schemes, ensuring that the lonely, isolated, most vulnerable are cared for. The use of this cathedral as a vaccination centre will be one of the enduring images of the pandemic, but it's representative of the ways in which churches across the diocese are caring for our neighbours. Who knows how long we will experience the impact of COVID-19? But I think we can already see how unrealistic it was to think it was going to be last year's problem and would be over by Christmas. Now, nor is it this year's problem. The vaccination program is giving hope, but the virus is such that until everyone is safe, no one is safe. It is a global pandemic. That's a good bit of learning at a time when there's been a rise in new nationalism. As the Pope observed in his encyclical on the environment, Laudato Si, the earth is our common home. We're in this together. Well, so far, I think so relatively obvious, but Lent brings us to something new. Thanks to the Industrial Revolution, there are more of us and we're economically wealthier, healthier, and live longer than our predecessors. We are addicted to economic growth, and those periods when the economy has not been thriving have also been times of social unrest. We now see that the pandemic is the first wave of a series of crises the economic, apparent, uh, the economic impact is already apparent, but it is likely to get worse. There are also the climate and the environmental crises which require collective action on a scale and at a pace we have never seen before. There will be technical solutions. The speed of decarbonisation is happening faster than anyone could have predicted 10 years ago. There have been days this winter when 60% of electricity used in this country has been from non-carbon sources, nuclear, wind and solar, as with the panels on the cloister roof here at the cathedral. A rough calculation suggests existing technology will achieve 70% of decarbonisation that's needed. The further 30% needs new ideas and creative innovation. People are intelligent and resourceful, so we can be optimistic. But we cannot be certain, and we do not have long. What Lent reminds us is both the urgency of what's required of us and that whilst life has been improved by economic growth, the good life is a very much richer concept. What matters is not how successful or how wealthy we are, but how good, creative, loving, just we are. There's a lot of work being done on what makes for happiness or well-being and the level of economic wealth is necessary but not sufficient. What the pandemic seems to be raising for us is how do we measure our wealth? The sorts of things addressed by the Des Cook to Review published 
the week before last. And we're having to ask, what is enough? Like St. Francis, who came from a wealthy family but embraced lady poverty and became the richest of poor men. There's something different going on in this account of our life. And it depends on our acceptance of God's forgiveness and loving mercy that makes us whole once again. All this is happening in the context of our being restricted to the local by a pandemic which has made us more aware of the global. Recreational international travel is off the agenda for the foreseeable future. In other words, we're being forced to live in a new way. And who would have believed it possible for us to make the changes that have taken place in the last year? There's been a dramatic change in the way we live and a reduction in the carbon footprint. We're living differently and it seems likely that things will never go back to the way they were. Doubtless this is for better and for worse. So we'll need to work out which of the enforced changes we want to keep. But we can't go back to things as they were because they were storing up such problems for us. What an opportunity then this Lent provides for us to explore what it means to live a good life, to ask what is enough and how we can live in this world together. This really is a time for turning ourselves around and asking what it means to love God and to love our neighbour and not to forget to love this wonderful world in which we have been set. Remember your mortality. Turn away from sin and be faithful to Christ. It is the basis for a joyful, hopeful and really useful Lent. To God be glory now and forever. Amen. Let us now call to mind our sin and the infinite mercy of God. God the Father, have mercy on us. God the Son, have mercy on us. God the Holy Spirit, have mercy on us. Holy, blessed and glorious Trinity, have mercy upon us. From all evil and mischief, from pride, vanity and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred and malice, and from all evil intent. Good Lord, deliver us. From sloth, worldliness and love of money, from hardness of heart and contempt for your word and your laws. Good Lord, deliver us from sins of body and mind, from the deceits of the world, the flesh and the devil. Good Lord, deliver us. In all times of sorrow, in all times of joy, in the hour of death and at the day of judgment, good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your birth, childhood and obedience, by your baptism, fasting and temptation. Good Lord, deliver us. By your ministry in word and work, by your mighty acts of power and by your preaching of the kingdom. Good Lord, deliver us. By your agony and trial, 
by your cross and passion, and by your precious death and burial. Good Lord, deliver us. By your mighty resurrection, by your glorious ascension, and by your sending of the Holy Spirit, good Lord, deliver us. Give us true repentance, forgive us our sins of negligence and ignorance, and our deliberate sins, and grant us the grace of your Holy Spirit to amend our lives according to your Holy Word. Holy God, holy and strong, holy and immortal, have mercy upon us. Make our hearts clean, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Father, eternal giver of light and grace, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour, in what we have thought, in what we have said and done, through, through ignorance, through weakness, and through our own deliberate fault. We have wounded your love and marred your image in us. We are sorry and ashamed and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and lead us out of darkness to walk as children of light. Amen. And so, may the Lord enrich you with his grace and nourish you with his blessing. The Lord defend you in trouble and keep you from all evil. The Lord accept your prayers and absolve you from your offences. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so let us pray. With faith and love and in union with Christ, let us offer our prayer before the throne of grace. Have mercy on your people, for whom your Son laid down his life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bring healing and wholeness to people and nations and have pity on those torn apart by division. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen all who are persecuted for your name's sake and deliver them from evil. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Look in mercy on all who suffer and hear those who cry out in pain and desolation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bring comfort to the dying and gladden their hearts with the power of your glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give rest to the departed and bring them with your saints to glory everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we rejoice in the triumph of the cross, we pray that the whole of creation may find fulfillment in the eternal kingdom of God. So we bring our prayers together in the words our Saviour taught us as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. 
So we continue with the Ash Wednesday response. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son. He is the sacrifice for our sins, that we might live through him. If God loves us so much, we ought to love one another. If we love one another, God lives in us. And the dismissal gospel. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous people who need no repentance. So may God the Father, who does not despise the broken spirit, give you a contrite heart. Amen. May Christ, who bore our sins in his body on the tree, heal you with his wounds. Amen. May the Holy Spirit, who leads us into all truth, speak to you words of pardon and peace. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you and those who you love, both living and departed, this Lent and forevermore. Amen. So that brings us to the end of this Ash Wednesday time of devotion. I encourage you very strongly to continue to join us as we gather, albeit in a virtual sense for now, as we spend time in the presence of our loving and compassionate Father. As we pray for our world and for one another. So until we meet again, until next Sunday, may God be with you all.